Good morning, everyone. I am Jonathan Little. Hope you're having a wonderful day. Today, we are going to be discussing some of my biggest cash game tips. You can actually download this entire PDF you're looking at over there at pokercoaching.com slash cash tips. Feel free to download it. Feel free to follow along. Cash games are an amazing way to have an actual, real, kind of hourly rate from poker, which is very different from cash games. I'm sorry, very different from tournaments, where in tournaments, you're going to have a ton of variance, right? Sometimes you're going to win, sometimes you're going to lose. Usually you're going to lose, but when you win, you win a ton. In cash games, if you're good, your graph is just going to slowly trickle upwards. Sure, you're going to have upswings, downswings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, but if you are good and you play in games where you have a big edge and you play them consistently, you put in a lot of hours, you will have a very solid hourly rate that's kind of consistent. For example, I used to play a Bellagio every day from noon until about midnight, sometimes a little bit later, sometimes I quit a little bit earlier, but I would put in at least eight hours a day, seven days a week. I did that for about a year. I would take off roughly one week per month to go play high stakes poker tournaments. But every single other day, I was playing poker. Probably about 10 hours a day on average. And I was making about $120 on average at five to no limit. You can do the math. Let me get out the calculator. Help everyone who's bad at math like myself. I'm bad at doing math on the fly. Let's say I put in 10 hours per day times, let's say 22 days per month times $120 an hour equals $26,000 per month. It's a pretty good win rate playing 5 10 no limit. You know what my biggest downswing ever was at 5 10 no limit hold'em? About $18,000. Not a lot. If you play with a big edge and you play a lot, you will smash your opponents. You have to make sure you have a big edge though. You have to make sure you have a big edge. That is vitally important. And this PDF here, the again, you can download completely free, pokercoaching.com slash cash tips will go a long way to helping you with that. So we are going to work through this line by line. I wrote this a year or two ago. So I don't remember any of it. <laughs> you have to realize these things are all just embedded into my brain. These are just things I know, but a lot of people don't know these things. So I want to share all of these with you today. So let's go through them line by line. Think about every action on every street before you act. Very, very true. A lot of people get it in their minds that the pre-flop action all of a sudden does not matter by the time they get to the river or say the flop checks through and then there's a bet on the turn and a bet on the river. They think that scenario is the same as if there's a bet on the flop and then a bet on the turn and a bet on the river. But those are very, very different scenarios, right? So you have to make sure that you're always considering how ranges get narrowed down based on various actions. Because if there's a bet on the flop and the turn in the river, the bet on the flop kind of indicates a polarized range in a lot of scenarios. But if there's a check on the flop, now you can remove a lot of the best hands going to the turn in the river. Which means the ranges are going to be way weaker in the second scenario when there is a check on the flop compared to the first scenario when there's a bet on the flop. But in both scenarios, there was a bet on the turn in the river, right? And a lot of people forget the fact that they took one betting round off. Obviously, um, if there's a three-bet preflop, that's very, very relevant, right? If there's a three-bet preflop, that's very different than if there's not a three-bet preflop. So always consider how the hand plays out. How important is table selection? I mean, you got to realize that in live poker, you're not going to get to table select all that much. You should not be changing tables four times an hour. That's ridiculous. But I mean, you should definitely try to make sure you're playing at the softest table possible, right? You want to make sure you're playing at the softest table in the game. I'm sure I'm going to say that at some point in this chart. Don't play robotically. Very clearly, very obviously. Don't just sit there and think you're going to play GTO poker and smash your opponents for a big win rate. Yeah, you'll win. But if you want to win as much money as possible, especially at small and medium stakes games, you need to be looking to maximally exploit the clear mistakes that your opponents are making. And quite often, your opponents will be making very, very, very clear mistakes. For example, if your opponents fold the big blind a little bit too much, if you're on the button, you should be raising much wider than 45% of hands. Maybe the right number is 60, maybe the right number is 80, maybe the right number is 100% of hands, depending on how tightly the blinds are playing, right? If you know the blinds are going to be three betting every single time, well, you should probably either four bet a lot or maybe even raise slightly tighter 
than the GTO range. So you can easily continue against the obvious three bet that's incoming, right? So always adjust to what your opponents do incorrectly. I think we discussed this actually last time on A Little Brain Fuel. Go back and watch last week's where we discuss various adjustments based on mis- common mistakes. Don't play the same generic style all the time, right? Similar, similar concept as before. I mean, this idea of robotically, you have to ask, like, what, what is the difference in these two topics? I mean, robotically can mean don't just play GTO, but it also can mean don't autopilot, right? Don't just get in some lull where you're just looking at your cards and playing your cards as you think it makes sense. It is worth noting that a lot of people's autopilot is better than other people's autopilot. A long time ago, I was studying poker with Dave Benefield, and uh, he's a very world-class player, and... I was struggling to beat 1020 online and he was smashing 1020 online. He's like, yeah, I just kind of play robotically. I just play ABC. I'm like, I'm just playing ABC too. And he's like, no, my ABC is probably different than your ABC, which is true. Turns out his ABC was good, strong GTO. My ABC was a little bit weak, a little bit too tight, a little bit too nitty. And it turns out that's enough to make you lose in the high stakes games. So you learn, right? You have to work hard, study hard and improve your skills. And in terms of don't play the same generic style all the time, I mean, look, if your opponents are atrociously bad and they're just like insane and they put in their money every hand with nothing, then yeah, I guess you can probably just sit there and play good cards and crush your opponents. But you do want to get in there and you do want to mix it up from time to time. I'm not going to, I mean, like a lot of people think this means changing gears. I don't think you necessarily want to be in there randomly doing things very different just because you've been tight recently or something like that. For example, say you folded the last 40 hands in a row because you had bad cards. If you get the Jack-7 suited under the gun, you probably should not raise it because it's nowhere near good enough to raise. You're just going to be torching money on average raising it, even if your opponents do proceed a little bit too tightly. So I'm not saying just do like blatantly bonkers plays, but if you do have a hand that's at the bottom of a preflop raising range or right on the cusp, and you have been very tight recently, it's probably okay to raise it. If you have not triple barreled off recently or ever against your opponents, it's probably fine to triple barrel it off a little bit more, right? So... There's, there's a fine line here between overly adjusting one way or the other. I don't think gigantic adjustments are usually a good idea unless you have a really, really good reason to make them. Adjust your strategy to exploit your specific opponents and exploit their tendencies. These kind of go hand in hand, right? Always, I mean, you may think, like, don't all these kind of say the same thing? And to be fair, they kind of do because it's actually really, really important. If I could devote some percentage of a document to help you beat cash games to the idea of exploit your opponents, I would devote almost the entire page to it. Exploit your opponents. You got to take advantage of the mistakes they are making. Shout out to Shalish and Igor, who both had massive scores over the last week from the poker coaching study groups. Good job. Good work. Raise with a different range based on the effective stack size. This is very, very important. Hopefully you all have studied with the poker coaching GTO preflop app. You will see that different hands change values as you get shallower or deeper. Offsuit hands, like king-jack offsuit, ace-jack offsuit, ace-10 offsuit, queen-jack offsuit, go way down in value as you get deeper and deeper stacked. Something you will see very, very clearly. You may be shocked as to how tight you should play with the offsuit hands facing a raise or a three bet when you are very deep stacked. Because you really want to have some hands in your range that can make the super nuts, which will be blushes. Turns out flushes are really, really good. And if you make flushes, you're probably going to win a big pot. You'll also find that um, suited connectors go way up in value as you get deeper stacked because they can make straights and flushes. Turns out straights and flushes are good because whenever you do make the nuts, you will be in very good shape. So you're going to find that your entire preflop strategy will differ based on stack depth. I know that may sound obvious to a lot of people today, but it was not obvious to a lot of people a long time ago. And it's probably not obvious to a lot of newer players because. Back in the day, people would play the same ranges from all positions. That was one of the main premises of my very first tournament book that I put out about 10 years ago was adjust your strategy based on stack depth. There was no other poker book on the market that discussed stack depth, which was insane to me. It was insane to me that none of them very clearly outlined different strategies based on stack depth, but they didn't. Now everybody realizes stack depth is very important because we've told everybody, but Make sure you play different ranges based on your effective stack size. All right, when calling a raise, ideally, especially in multi-way pots, you want to make sure you are getting the correct implied odds. Okay? So with small pairs, 
you want to be getting at least 10 to 1 implied odds to some extent. Now, look, these odds are not exactly accurate because you have to realize if you're playing good, fundamentally sound poker, you're going to win the pot sometimes when you don't make a set, right? Say somebody raises and you call on the big blind with pocket fours, right? Even if you're playing, let's say, 30 big blinds deep. If they made it three big blinds and you call, you're barely getting, the, I guess you're getting 15 to one right there anyway, so you're getting good odds. But imagine you just check it down with your pocket fours or they bet one time on seven, three, two, and then they check it down. You win, right? So uh, usually with small pairs, you're, you're going to be getting the right implied odds. Um, sometimes you won't be if you raise, so let's say three big blinds and somebody makes it 15 big blinds and then it gets back to you and you're playing 100 big blinds deep or they're playing 60 big blinds deep, right? There you have to put in 10 or 12 to try to win 60 which means you're getting six to one, which is not quite the right price to call with them uh, with the small pairs. But for the most part, playing 100 big blinds or deeper, you're usually going to want to be calling three bets if you put in the initial raise. Now, something a lot of people do wrong with small pairs. Somebody raises, somebody three bets, and we're playing, let's say, 200 big blinds deep, very deep stacked. And you're on the button with pocket eights. Raise, three bet. Raise to three big blinds, re-raise to nine big blinds. You have pocket eights, 200 big blinds deep. You may think, all right, I'm getting 20... Two to one implied odds. Easy call with pocket eights. Notice here with suited connectors and suited aces to some extent. 20 to one implied odds. We're getting 20 to one. We can call with those too. But no, 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 no. That would be a blunder. That would be a big, big, big mistake because you're forgetting that somebody yet to act can re-raise, especially the initial raiser. So these are hands that you cannot be cold calling with at all. That is a big blunder. But if you raise and somebody three bets you, and then it gets back to you. You're closing the action. Now you can call with those hands, playing 200 big blinds deep, because now you're getting your proper 10 to 1 implied odds with small pairs and 21 implied odds with suited connectors and, to some extent, suited aces. Also realize, though, as your opponent is more and more aggressive, you will realize your full implied odds more, but you will not get to win at showdown with a marginal made hand as often, because they're going to bluff you off of it, right? So as your opponent's like weaker and tighter, you're not going to realize your implied odds, but you will inevitably get to just call one bet and then check it down more often. So these numbers are not it's clearly set in stone. They're not clearly defined rules, but they are something you to some extent want to keep in mind. Um, mainly because as you get really shallow, you, you just can't call the suited connectors quite as often, for example. Unless, of course, you're so shallow to the point that um, you can just make any pair or any draw and get your money in. All right, with an effective stack size of 40 big blinds or greater, Try to play lots of pots in position, especially when you can get heads up against opponents who play poorly post-flop. Yes, if your opponent's going to play poorly post-flop, you want to call a decent amount in position. We pull up the poker coaching charts. Let me see if I can pull up the poker coaching charts on the side while I'm talking. Um, you'll find that in general, the times that you want to call decently wide are when you are going to be in position. If you're going to be in position, then... You get to call and see the flop decently often. All right, here we go. Here's the poker coaching charts. GTO cash game charts. Let's say we're 100 big blinds deep. Let's say we're on the button. Let's say we are versus a raise from the low jack seat. You're going to see that we have a decent amount of green here. The green hands are all called, okay? By the way, this app is available on your phone. We are currently working with Google because they've been slow to update our app. They changed something. It broke everything, and they're slow to update our app and a whole bunch of other people's apparently. No clue why, but the Apple app should be working no problem. Anyway, as you see, on the button, we get to call decently wide. Now, this might actually be tighter than you think you should be calling. Notice, like I said, kind of deep stack, hands like king, jack, king, queen, ace, ten are really bad. Turns out, you're not even supposed to play these hands if your opponents are playing well. Now, I will say, this chart presumes your opponent is raising with this range. Okay? If your opponents are looser... As a lot of people will be, they'll raise 9, 8, 8, 7, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, queen, jack, king, 10, ace, 9, jack, 10. If they're raising all those hands, then you in turn get to play a little bit wider even, right? So, obviously, don't use the GTO chart if your opponent is not playing anywhere near GTO. So you probably in reality want to call a little bit wider and 3-bet a little bit wider in this scenario. If we're 200 big blinds deep, you're going to see we get to play a little bit wider as well because we are now in position playing deeper stacked, right? As you get deeper and deeper stacked, you get to play slightly wider ranges. And I would definitely play even wider than this. Like I'd play every suited ace, every pair, all the suited connectors down to like four or three suited probably. All these hands that are like mixing with green, 
I would just like call or three bet all of them. You gotta realize all these hands on the bottom of the playable range. Look, look at Ace Jack here. Ace Jack offsuit still barely plays. Um, it's three betting some, it's calling some, it's folding most of the time. I would probably play this with either three betting or calling every time. I would not fold it. Same thing with the King Queen offsuit. So I'd be mixing these just like three betting and calling. Um, a lot of King X suiteds. I think it's fine to call in this scenario. These suited connected hands, I would mostly call. I would three bet a little bit more polarized probably than this. Um, one thing you'll find that's kind of interesting is as you get deeper and deeper stacked, you actually use way more mixed strategies just in general because it's really important to have board coverage on every board, meaning you can have the effective nuts on every flop, which is why you see like pocket six is three betting. Whereas when you're playing uh, 100 big blinds deep, you're not going to be three betting the pocket sixes very often at all. So you'll see that happening. But in general, I think that... Um, you you definitely want to make a point to call a decent amount on specifically the button. Notice if you're in the cutoff, you're going to call less, right? And if you're in the hijack seat, you're going to call even less. So your calling percentage goes down. Notice here, we have these percentages here. Three betting, 6.1, calling 2.9 in the hijack. In the cutoff, it's going to get a little bit wider, right? But still more three betting than calling. On the button, it's going to be closer to more calling. Well, it is more calling than it is three betting, right? So on the button is the main time you get to call decently wider. Yeah, Kevin, the, the apps are having a bit of trouble right now. Uh, send, us, send us an email with whatever the problem was. And we will address it. When I mean, we're doing our best to address it. The problem is, is whenever you're in this like uh, renewal process with Google, like, we're doing our best with it. Don't know what to tell you. They're taking their time. Sometimes they take their time. You must get well out of your comfort zone and exploit your opponent's weaknesses if you want to become a big winner. Very, very true. If you want to become a big winner at poker, you must exploit the things your opponents do wrong. If you only pay attention to your own two cards, your position, and your chip stack, you are certain to fail. Very, very true. This is a scenario where a lot of people get it in their heads that they can just play good cards. Just play their hands. How hard can it be? Look down at good cards, play good cards. But you got to realize that's probably a mistake. For example, I mean, just look at preflop raising ranges on the button. Right? A lot of people, if you give them the 5-3 suited on the button, or the king-7 offsuit, or the 10-8 offsuit, or the king-8 offsuit, or the ace-4 offsuit, or the jack-4 suited, or the 10-5 suited, they just fold. They think, nah, nah, that's not very good. I'll just fold. But you should definitely be playing. These are good hands. These are playable hands. These are profitable hands. Right? And if you, let's say, this is, this is small blinds, right? We're looking at it. Let's look at big, uh, big blind versus arrays from the button. Notice here, this is a spot a lot of people screw up. This is the GTO strategy. You may think this is tight. You may think this is loose. Who knows? Um, this is a situation where if you look at this, notice all of these hands in this vicinity are three bet. Suited connected hands, 100 big blinds deep, are three bet a lot from the big blind versus a button raise. And to some extent, even against like early position raises, but they'll get pushed up a little bit up here, right? So you'll notice as your opponent gets in uh, later and later position, you start three betting more suited connected type hands. And as your opponent's position gets later, those kind of get bumped down even further and further and further, right? So you see, these hands are the ones that like to three bet, especially against late position raises. But most people in the big blind never, ever, ever three bet jack 10 suited, 10 nine suited, nine to jack eight, nine suited, queen 10 suited. They three bet none of these. They just play straightforwardly, and that's a problem. Big Hurt Atlanta says, in the previous chart, why would we call King 6 suited and not King 7 and King 8? It has to do with your opponent's raising range and not wanting to be dominated by it. King 6 is less likely to be dominated, apparently, than uh, King 8 and King 7, for whatever reason. Y you got to realize, whenever you're looking at these charts, to some extent, it's a little bit arbitrary. Because, like right here, notice King 6, 3 bet sometimes, and call sometimes. King five, three bet sometimes, and call sometimes. I would not be shocked at all if sometimes King four, three bets, and calls. Like, I mean, like, it doesn't really matter as long as you're somewhere in the ballpark. But it also is going to be heavily dependent on... Um, it's going to be heavily dependent on what your opponent's preflop raising range contains, right? So as, as you're going to be dominating more hands, you use those hands more often. As you're going to be dominating less often, you use them less often. It's, it's, it's a nitpicky thing that I would definitely not recommend spending much effort over. Also, by the way, I don't think you need to memorize these charts because read basically all these other lines here. All these lines to some extent say, exploit your opponent. Don't presume they're playing the GTO strategy. I'm sitting here telling you, most people simply 
pay attention to their own cards and play kind of straightforwardly, right? And if they're playing kind of straightforwardly, then, you know, your strategies will be very, very different. Focus on your opponents, of course. Pay attention to every single hand that takes place. Most definitely. Most definitely pay attention to every hand that takes place. A lot of people sit there and play on their phone, or they talk to their friends, or they watch sports, or they look at people walking around the casino, or they look at people at other poker tables, or they get up and they walk around when they're not in a hand, or they just sit there and they zone out. All those things are mistakes. That is a big blunder. And that's a mistake. You need to pay attention. How to know someone is baiting. I don't know what baiting means. Is that like catfishing? Does that mean like when you think, when they have a strong hand and they want you to bluff? Well, you have to realize if your opponent plays well, they should always have good hands in their checking range. That's how GTO poker works. They also should have weak hands in their checking range. They should have marginal hands in their checking range. Now, if your opponent's really bad, and they're like atrociously bad players, sometimes you can look and tell by the way they are looking at you that they want you to bluff. If you're playing live poker. Sometimes it's obvious. When you're playing online, it's essentially impossible because usually people are playing closer to GTO and they may have slightly more checking range or slightly more nuts in their checking range than they should. They take notes. Take notes and pay attention, right? Pay attention to every single hand. You see somebody likes to trap, maybe don't bet so much, especially with your marginal main hands for thin value and especially with your bluffs, right? But if your opponent is going to check with a bunch of garbage and exactly the nuts, they're going to get you when they have the nuts because it's so profitable for you to bluff when they have nothing that they're going to lose so much money in those scenarios whenever they check. Why aren't you playing the win? Oh, because I have a life. I have two children who have birthdays in December. We had a birthday party last weekend. We had a birthday party this weekend. Today is my uh, little son's birthday. On the 24th, it's my other son's birthday. The 22nd is my birthday. Got a nice party day happening later this week. I'm going to see... Going to go to have some uh, lunch and drinks with some friends. Then I'm going to go to see my favorite show. Then I'm going to go have some dinner with some friends. Then I may stop by a poker game for a little bit. Then I'm going to go home. It's going to be a lot of fun. But no, so look, you got to realize these people... Well, look, at some point in time, your life's goal is going to shift from trying to maximize your, let's say, career to doing things that you think are more valuable. Whenever you're young and you have infinite time and you don't really have many commitments, most of your effort should be spent bettering your career because you don't really have a whole lot else working for you, right? But once you have a family, once you have other things happening, like I have a poker training site, if you all did not know, and... Um, all these things just happen to be very, very busy in December. December's a busy time of the year. Uh, we just had a gigantic Black Friday sale. We just released a gigantic advanced tournament course at PokerCoaching.com. That'll take a, takes a lot of effort. We have a New Year's challenge coming out very, very soon. That takes a lot of effort. This is crunch time at Poker Coaching Business, if you did not know. So we have crunch time at Poker Coaching. I got two kids with a birthday. It's holiday season, right? A lot of stuff is going on. That's what it amounts to. And, you know, for other people, that's different times of the year. Some people don't have that time of the year at all. Um, some people have that time and they don't care. So, you know, you got to figure out what your priorities are. Is baiting like a counterspell? Yeah, exactly. Play the second best card first. All right, take mental notes about your opponent, right? Or if you have a bad memory, like I do, write notes in a notebook or in your phone, right? It's very, 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 very important to make sure you are aware of the mistakes your opponents make and that you are willing to get out of line and take advantage of them. I will say I'm surprised that the win got so many people. I don't really know why it got so many people. I get the idea that they just gave away a bunch of seats to people who don't know how to play poker, but I'm surprised it got so many people. One time at the M Casino, not the win, but the M, a lot of you may not even know the M, uh, they, had, they had a tournament where they did not publicize it at all, except for exactly their like um, other properties around the country, and they gave away something like $200, $3,500 buy-in seats to slot machine players. Literal slot machine players. That was, that was a jackpot that they did. They gave away $3,500 seats to 200 people. So this created the softest tournament ever because nobody knew about it. I learned about it from Alan Kessler, and I lived literally a two-minute walk from the casino. I didn't even know it was happening, and I lived right there. And that was the softest tournament in the world. I didn't win, but a whole bunch of pros won. They scooped up all that money, and they smashed them. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a great opportunity. And this tournament was not to that extreme, 
but it was similar where they gave away a bunch of $10,000 buying entries to people who are not high stakes poker players, which is going to make for a very, very soft tournament. Turns out tournaments are pretty soft whenever you put on a gigantic guarantee and you give away a whole bunch of seats, either in satellites or in just stone giveaways. And poker room has been closed for many years. It was not in the poker room. Poker room was already closed, I think. It was at the, uh, some convention center downstairs by the pool. I just lived like right next there. It was a good place. They had a, they had a nice little buffet, nice and easy. They had a nice sports book. Fun times. So better to build your bankroll with cash games or tournaments. We talked about that at the top of the show. Cash games by a mile because you can win consistently. On the final table, someone folded ace king to a three bet. That's probably a mistake. All right. Take notes on each on what each specific player does incorrectly. Okay, you got to figure out not what everybody does, but what specific people do. Okay, figure out what your exact specific opponent does incorrectly. Happy birthday to Louis Philippe. He puts in great work for poker coaching in the Discord and the study sessions. He also writes epic articles. He consolidates a bunch of notes and sends them to me. I learn a ton. He makes my life easy. So congrats to or happy birthday to Louis Philippe. All of our birthdays are in December, apparently. Who else had the birthday in December? If you have a birthday in December, click the like button. If you don't, click the subscribe button. It'll work out either way. All right, always put your opponents on a range of hands rather than a specific hand. This is something that I hope is obvious to almost everyone at poker at this point in time, but it's definitely not because whenever I was just in a $5,000 buying tournament in Florida, I heard people saying, oh, I put them on, I put them on ace jack. Yeah, well, hate to break it to you. If you're putting people on a hand in 2022, or 2023, you're going to lose. You have literally no shot of winning if you are consistently putting people on one hand. If you put people on one hand, you're done. Philippus with the prime sub. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so you got to put people on a range of hands, right? I mean, I already showed you the preflop range chart, right? So in this scenario, if, if somebody raises the button and I'm in the big blind and I think they play well, I'm going to use this strategy. I'm going to three bet all these hands in red. So when I three bet, you cannot put me on ace queen because realize I could have any of these hands. Now, certainly I have all the ace queen, so I'm most likely to have ace queen. I have all full 16 combinations of ace queen. That's the most likely hand that an ace king, but I could easily have jack 10 suited or 10 seven suited or seven six suited or pocket nines or pocket aces, right? I can have all of this. And the idea of I'm going to put you on ace queen is going to result in you losing because, you know, obviously it becomes 9-6-3 and you put me on ace-queen, but I actually have pocket nines. You just load your money in. Well, it's not going to work out for you, right? When's the best cash game course coming? Next year sometime. Would you believe that it took us about nine months to get the advanced tournament course together? It'll hopefully take less time now that we have a nice, solid template for it, but it, it, was, a, it was a bit of work. You really like the Justin Saliba content, says Louis Fleet. I like the Justin Saliba content as well. Um, recently, Justin Sleebo chopped a $25,000 buy-in tournament. I thought he was going to win the tournament at, uh, the 25k at Hard Rock, but he decided to bluff it all off. He ran a savage bluff. I liked the bluff. It felt like a dirty spot. Like, I was sitting there putting myself in his opponent's shoes, and I'm like, wow. Yeah, he's got some bluffs, but he's got a whole lot of nuts. And it turns out, he had a bluff, and his opponent decided to not call. His opponent is kind of known to be a bit of a calling station player, though. Feels a little dirty bluffing into a calling station player, but Justin had one of the absolute best hands to do it with. He did it. He's not afraid. And sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. But two final table 25Ks back to back. Solid, solid performance from Justin Sleeper recently. Two bracelets recently. One bracelet this year. I don't know if the other bracelet was this year. It was either this year or last year. I don't know. He's been smashing it. Would you all know? I'm going to give you all a little bit of insight, insight here. Justin Sleeper came to me about 10 years ago and told me, Jonathan Little, I like your poker content, but your Instagram is terrible. Can I take over your Instagram and try to make it better? This is when he was in college, playing 25 cent, 50 cent, no limit online. The exchange was, I'm going to help him to poker for a little bit each month. He's going to work on my Instagram a lot. He made my Instagram much better. He got better at poker. We started working together more and more. Then he started working with, uh, working on YouTube, working on Twitter, working on all sorts of other stuff. He still didn't know how to play poker very well. But eventually, he went to go get out of college. He said, either I'm going to go become an engineer or I'm going to work at poker coaching. It's up to you if you want to pay me an engineering salary. I'm like, well, I certainly can't lose him. So I guess I have to pay engineering salary now. And then, well, now, now he's the boss. <laughs> now he's in charge of everything. 
And he's also a world-class poker player. I've, I've told him everything I could possibly do to lead him the right direction in poker. Told him people to make friends with, to get really good at the game. He listened to everything I said, and now he's got two bracelets crushing 25Ks. And he puts together a whole lot of the content at Poker Coaching. Jason Mary was running well at the WPT when checking the other day. Didn't seem to lose it all quickly. <laughs> James has that propensity. James has that propensity. Okay, okay, okay. Don't put people on a specific hand. All right. Value bet when you think you have the best hand most of the time and you think your opponent can call with many weaker hands. And here's very important. This is not or, this is and. Okay? Value bet, probably wider than you think. Value bet wider than you think. And you're going to find that as long as you're not using bet sizes that are too gigantic, most people are going to find calls, especially in spots where the pot's not that big. Like, say you raise, I don't know, say you raise like pocket sevens from the button and the big blind calls, and it comes king, queen, three, and you let it go check, check. Turns a two, and it goes check, check. Rivers a six, and they check. Now, checking is probably a nice, fine, reasonable, viable strategy, right? But this is a spot where you almost always have the best hand because most people will value bet a king or a queen either on the turn or the river. So you should probably put in a small bet. You're trying to get called by a random bottom pair, like a six, a three, or a two, or even ace high. And you're going to find that if you bet something like half pot there, you're going to get called a lot of the time, and you're going to win a lot of the time. But you have clearly a very marginal hand, right? Like pocket sevens on king, queen, six, three, two is not a great hand. But you got to realize when it goes check, 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 you probably have the best hand, and you can actually get called by some worse hands as long as you don't bet too big. So make sure you're not leaving value on the table. And you got to realize that scenario comes up decently often, and if you miss out on a three or four big blind bet every time, I mean, that's that's a large amount of your win rate just sticking in your opponent's stack and not going to yours. Value bet relatively weak made hands on the turn against loose calling station players who rarely fold any main hand or draw. Similar thing, right? Especially if you check back a hand like Middle pair. Say you have the queen nine suited. You raise, big blind calls. They're kind of calling stationy. They check the flop, you check it back. Turns not a scary card. King, queen, three, six. They check again. Definitely value bet this queen here. You would not want to value bet this queen against a good player. You just want to check it back and then call a river bet or value bet on the river and they check to you. But against a calling station, you can very easily value bet the turn medium and then value bet the river medium. And now you get a three or four big blind turn bet in and then you get a six or eight big blind river bet in. A lot of people, though, just check it down. So imagine you're getting in an extra, I don't know, 12 big blinds against these calling stations that your opponents are not. And you probably win 60 or 70% of the time. I mean, that's just value coming your way. You got to realize that you're not going to win these every time. Sometimes your opponent's going to show you a bad king or a queen jack or something, right? But they're going to call with a whole lot of weaker hands. And as long as you're getting back more than 50% of the money, that's good for you. And if your opponent does happen to fold out some hands with equity, like a gut shot or ace high or whatever, that's fine, right? I mean, that's equity that they would otherwise extract whenever they do happen to get there 10 or 20% of the time, whatever it is. Do not value bet when you think you have the best hand most of the time and you think your opponents will fold most hands that you beat. Okay, let's go back to that king, queen, six, king, queen, three, two, six example. Say you have ace two, okay? Say you raise, big blind calls, it comes king, queen, three. They check, you decide to check it back. You should probably bet, whatever. Turn is a two. They check, you check it again. River's a six, they check. You probably have the best hand with your ace two. I don't know the exact number, but I would guess you win this hand like 60% of the time when it checks through, maybe 70% of the time. But if you bet, what are they gonna call you with? Well, they're going to call you with any king, queen, six, or three. Maybe a two, but a two is kind of unlikely for them to have, given you have one, and people don't play too many hands with a two to begin with. So this is a spot where when they do call you, it's either going to be with a hand that beats you, or maybe a few hands that you beat. They could have ace high, but notice you block the ace high as well. This is a particularly bad hand to value bet on the river. But a lot of people, they think, ho, oh, ho, I have the best hand, I bet. But that's not a good enough reason to bet. You have to... Value bet when you have the best hand most of the time and you think your opponent will call with many weaker hands. And, and, they have to call with many weaker hands. If they will not call with many weaker hands, 
then you cannot value bet. Also, do not value bet the turn of the river against tight players who will fold all of their worse hands and continue with all their better hands. Same logic, same strategy, right? This is a situation where if your opponents are going to fold out all the hands you want to get value from, it only really makes sense to bet whenever they probably have a whole lot of equity, but people don't fold out hands with a whole lot of equity. Like say you think they either have a pair or a good draw and you're sitting there with bottom pair. Not a good time to bet because they're not going to fold out the good draws and they're not going to fold out the pairs that beat you. So you're just putting in money very, very poorly, right? Pot control to avoid getting blown off your hand and to induce your opponent to bluff. This goes back to that queen nine example. You raise queen nine, big blind calls, king, queen six. They check, you bet. I'm sorry, check, check on the flop. Turn is whatever. They check. This is a great spot to check behind unless they're a calling station because if you bet and get raised with queen nine on king, queen six, three, it's a pretty bad scenario. But if you let it go check, check, if they bet the river, you can obviously call because they have a whole lot of garbage in their range. And if they check the river, then you can value bet the river and you keep the pot medium, okay? You're going to find that for the most part, one pair without a great kicker, I'm sorry, a hand top pair with a bad kicker and worse is usually good for two streaks of value at most and usually just one. In the ideal world, you'll want to put in about one or two bets with these hands. And especially with middle pairs that are not all that vulnerable, like king, queen, six, queen nine is not that vulnerable to being outdrawn because the only bad card for you really is an ace, right? Every other card's like not that bad. So this is a scenario where you really do not want to bet and get raised and you can very easily induce bluffs. I mean, to some extent, say it does go check, check on the flop and your opponent bets the turn and you call and they bet the river. Pretty easy call. As long as they're not super nitty and they know how to bluff to some extent, right? These are spots where you want to pot control. That said, do not pot control when your opponents will pay you off poorly. Essentially, don't pot control against calling stations. You don't want to pot control against calling stations because calling stations will put in a lot of money. Like I said, against a calling station, king, queen, six, maybe just bet the flop and the turn and the river if they're extreme calling stations, but you'll probably want to check back one street and then bet the turn and bet the river. Also, this is an important one a lot of people forget. Do not pot control when your opponents will rarely bluff the river. One of the main values of checking behind on the flop and the turn is that you want to induce your opponents to bluff on the river. Check, check, flop, check, check, turn. If they bet the river, easy call with queen nine. But what if they will not bluff the river with queen nine? What if they're sitting there with like the nut low, just total garbage, and they decide to check and let you win? Well, your check on the turn did not actually induce the bluffs that you want. And you got to realize that your opponent's not always going to have garbage for nothing. Sometimes they're going to have a gut shot straight draw or an ace for an overcard or whatever, right? And if they'll fold out these three outs or four outs or whatever they have to a bet, that's way better than letting it check down because whenever you let it check down, they get there seven or eight or 10% of the time. And then that's seven or eight or 10% of the pot you lose. And if they're not going to make up for that by bluffing a lot of the time when they miss, there's no point in pot controlling. So this is a situation where you want to ask, will my opponents bluff the river some, right? Louis Philippe says the population doesn't bet the river often enough. I agree, but if you let people get to the river with junky hands, quite often they will still just bet because they don't know what to do, especially in live poker. If you give somebody the, the eight high on the river and they think that you have ace high, assuming they're like anywhere near competent, they're going to attempt to try to bluff you. Sometimes with a big bet, which you can then easily call. <sighs> Let's see. Against players who play too many hands too passively. These are players who are essentially loose, but not aggressive. Loose and passive, okay? There are some spectrums here where people can either play loose, too loose or too tight pre-flop, or they can play too tightly or too aggressively. I'm sorry, too, too passively or too aggressively. Understand that loose does not always go with aggressive. Tight does not always go with passive. They can go together, okay? So against players who play too many hands too passively, you're going to want to value bet relentlessly because they're not going to put money in themselves, right? Also, you're going to want to fold whenever they apply significant aggression. If these players who are a little bit too tight and passive 
I'm sorry, not tight. Gosh, I'm screwing this up left and right. Against players who are too passive. Has nothing to do with tight. Against players who are too passive. If they usually check too often. When they do decide to put in a lot of money, they usually have a good hand. Therefore, you should overfold, right? You're also going to want to bluff on later streets when they have a marginal range and you think they will fold. Quite often, these players, if they check flop, check turn, and then check river, they just have nothing every time. And if they have nothing every time, or if, even if they have a hand like middle pair and they'll fold it to a bet, some people will. Some people actually told me, some very new students who came to me in the past, you know, if I have middle pair and they bet big on the river, I just fold. I just give it to them. Well, that's a mistake. <laughs> and if they'll fold out hands like middle pair, then smash them. Bet and steal the pot. You had ace-king in position versus king-queen. Flop. Well, you don't know what your opponent's had. Come on. You had ace-king in position. Flop comes king 4-4. Four, four. I guess you 3-bet. So look, this is a bad hand history here because I don't know if you raise pre-flop. I don't know if there's a 3-bet pre-flop. You had ace-king in position. I presume they raise, raise and you just called. You should definitely 3-bet. This is a bad hand history. I'm not even going to read this. You need to know the action. Go to jonathanlittlepoker.com slash notes. Present the hand like that and I will discuss it. You're seeing lots of players potting it in the micro stakes. Is the counter here just tighten up? And, or wait for a good hand. If your opponents are blasting money into the pot, then it's fine just to make like one, like decent one pair hands and then call down, right? Like if they're putting in way too much money, way too wide, call down. Now, of course, just if they're not that active and they're blasting it, it's fine to be tight, right? So again, pay attention to what I'm talking about right here. It's going to be very, very important. Against players who play too many hands too aggressively. Maybe that's this type of player. By the way, you can download this PDF. There's a whole nother page, by the way. Against uh, players who play too many hands too aggressively. My brain's all over the place this morning, everyone. You can get the PDF. Look way down there. Pokercoaching.com slash cash tips. Go download it. Okay. Focus. Focus, Jonathan. Focus. I love the show because it gets me focused at the beginning of the morning sometimes. Because quite often on Monday mornings, I have a million things to do on my to-do list. I got a bunch of emails incoming. I have this show to deal with. I gotta order groceries for the week. Hectic morning. Okay. Against players who play too many hands too aggressively, realize they often have marginal hands, even when they apply aggression, even when they apply pressure, right? These players bet when they don't know what else to do. Okay? Their bets do not represent strong hands. Their bets represent an extraordinarily wide range of nonsense, okay? By the way, this idea of what does the bet represent, you got to get that concept out of your head because the bets don't represent anything. They represent different portions of a range. And if your opponent's anywhere near decent, when they bet, they're going to have some nuts and they're going to have some nothing. When they check, they're going to have some marginal hands and some nuts and some nothing if they're good, right? And I provide you a link, pokercoaching.com slash cash tips. It's, I can't stick my hand down through the chat. It's way down there. If I could just like, it's like on the floor. Okay. Pokercoaching.com slash cash tips. Okay. When these players bet, their bets do not indicate strength. Realize if you induce them to bluff, do not fold decently strong hands. Okay. This goes back to the question earlier. What do I do if they just keep blasting it? Well, the answer is, Certainly don't fold. Certainly don't fold. Check and then call and keep them in with all their garbage, right? Louis Philippe says right here, constructing a good checking range is a great strategy against lags. Yeah, the thing is, is what a lot of people do wrong is they check raise with all their good hands against loose aggressive players because they don't want to get outdrawn. But you have to realize if your opponent's drawing to three outs or four outs or eight outs or zero outs, if they're going to keep bluffing it off on most boards, you don't really care if they stay in the pot. Yeah, you get outdrawn some small portion of the time. That's okay. Get used to it. It is going to happen 25, 30% of the time. In exchange for getting outdrawn 25 or 30% of the time, you're going to induce your opponents to just put loads of money in with literally no equity. Okay? Next, be willing to bluff often because they will usually fold if you apply aggression. Going back to what a lot of people do very incorrectly, they check raise their good hands against maniacs and check fold everything else. Which is exactly what the maniacs want them to do. Because whenever they get check raised, they can just fold all their garbage. And whenever you call, they know that they can probably bluff you off by the river with a big bet. 
So what you should do instead is you'd be check raising more often with hands that don't really want to call a flop bet or call a turn bet. So if you don't really want to call a flop or turn bet, maybe with a hand like a gut shot or two over cards to the back door flush draw, these are hands that you should be way more willing to check raise bluff. Because if they do just decide to load the money in, fine, you can fold because you don't have much equity anyway. And um, they're usually going to fold because they're going to think you have a good hand. These players beat players by making them fold out marginal hands too often and by not paying them off whenever they are they happen to be against a strong hand, right? So check raise bluff more often against these players with hands that cannot reasonably check and then call a turn bet because you're going to face a turn bet a lot of the time. Also, bluff them on scary boards. Uh, yeah, they're going to have some nuts on the scary boards, but especially if you bluff them in spots where you have a lot of good hands or you should have a lot of good hands, um, this is going to be very, very good for you. Against players who play too few hands too passively, these are going to be the nits. Raise their blinds relentlessly. Raise from the cutoff more often because they're not going to play quite as aggressively on the button. For example, for example, we have these handy dandy charts here. Let's say we're in the cutoff. Raise first end range, 100 big blinds deep. Notice we can profitably raise 25% of hands normally. Okay? Okay, okay, okay. What about if the button is nitty? Now, obviously, let me show you what the button should do. In uh, what am I doing? Button versus raise from cutoff. Notice in this scenario, this is how the button should play. Okay? This is how the button should play. In this situation, if they're going to play tighter than this, and especially if they're not going to three bet as often, imagine they don't three bet any of these hands because they're weak and tight. Imagine they never three bet the queen jack, king jack, ace 10, jack 9 suited, king 8 suited, ace 3 suited, etc. Imagine they call or fold all that. Well, now you can raise wider in the cutoff. Now, how much wider? I don't know. It varies depending on what your opponent's doing correctly. But in this scenario, you can probably play, I don't know, 35% of hands if your opponent's just not going to three bet you often enough, which will mainly mean adding more suited connected hands, small pairs, maybe like ace nine, I'm sorry, ace eight, king nine, jack uh, 10, nine, stuff like that. It's probably going to be fine. How much, of this how much of this would be relevant in tournament play? All of it. I think a lot of people will get confused thinking tournaments and cash games are drastically different games, you have to realize the main difference in um, cash games compared to tournaments is that tournaments have payout implications and usually you're, usually you're playing shallower stacks. So if the topic I'm discussing does not discuss payout implications and it does not discuss playing shallow stacks, well, that applies to tournaments and cash games pretty much the same. What happens if your maniac is over betting? Congratulations. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, you, you just get more money? Obviously, figure out your opponent's range. Maybe your maniac overbets with bluffs and pots it with the nuts. Who knows? How can you get this app of the preflop charts? It is at pokercoaching.com. If you are a premium member, you have full access to this. We also have heads up charts with a small ante and with a one big blind ante. We also have ICM charts, for example, five way ICM charts with a one big blind ante. These are kind of neat. We just added these recently. Notice we have these handy dandy charts. This presumes the stacks are. 20 big blinds under the gun, 30 big blinds in the cutoff, 60 big blinds on the button, 15 big blinds in the small blind, 44 big blinds in the big blind. In this scenario, yeah, that's too far below. What you do is you can either just like go straight to the spot, say you're on the button, here's what you should do on the button, or say under the gun folds. Now, what does the cutoff do? Let's say the cutoff min raises, okay? Now it will tell you what the button should do, what the small blind should do, and what the big blind should do. So now let's say the button three bets. Notice button's very deep here, so they get to play a lot of hands. Notice right here, right? I want some strategy here. Cutoff has 30 big blinds, button has 60, small blind has 15, okay? Small blind, having 15 big blinds here lets the button play very, 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 very wide, okay? So in this scenario, now we can, um, you see a lot of calling, but also a lot of three betting with blockers. A lot of ace X, a lot of king X suited blockers, three betting, okay? Okay, so say we call. Now, what should the small blind do? We're now in this weird multi-way spot where cutoff min raises, button calls. Now, this shows you what small blind should do and what big blind should do. Notice, lots of all ends. Why lots of all ends? Well, first off, small blind's kind of shallow. But take a look at this weird strategy from the big blind. This is something I would literally never do. And this is where, like, I learn in this process. Notice big blind should shove all in with all these hands in dark red for 44 big blinds. <laughs> what? What? 
Well, they can shove so wide because Button's calling range is going to be pretty weak, right? We saw Button was three betting very polarized. You can actually click back here. And uh, let's go back here. We would click on cut off min raise. Notice Button, when they do call, they're pretty weak, right? Like, what are they going to call a 45 big line shove with? Essentially nothing, right? So now in this scenario, say they do call, now we see uh, small blind folds, and now big blind gets to shove very wide. Small blind, let's say they do go all in, it'll now tell you what cutoff should call with and what button should call with, right? Which is like almost nothing over here, obviously nuts over here. So anyway, these are all in the, in the app. As uh, Louis Philippe said, there's a few poker sites out there who have charts like this. They charge, well, I know one of them charges $500 a month for charts like this. These are just included in poker coaching. We're going to continuously add more and more and more spots. We also have three-way spots. We have spots where we have a different anti-size. Does this update automatically? Not one of them. Whatever. Okay, anyway, we have, um, those are all available. They will be in the poker coaching app soon if they're not already. And they're on the website. Obviously, we have the more basic charts of just preflop tournament and cash game charts as well. Gotta love these people. There's some fun people in this world, are there not? I don't know anything about poker. Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Against players who play too few hands too aggressively. These are going to be the tight, aggressive players. Okay? They play too few hands, but when they do play, they load their money in. Okay? Do not try to bluff them off hands they think are strong. These players, whenever they do have a hand like jacks, they're not going to fold them. These are players who sat, sat around. They're going to play good cards. When they do get good cards, they're going to load their money in. So do not try to bluff them out of the pot. Now, whenever they do raise, especially when you're in position, implied odds hands go through the roof because these types of players are going to be very inclined to just blast off post-flop. If you give them a hand like pocket aces, they're going to pot the flop, pot the turn, pot the river, and give you all their money if you can beat aces. So play hands that can beat aces, like suited connectors and whatnot. Very importantly, do not stack off with hands worse than top pair, top kicker against these players because these players usually don't bluff off quite enough and their range is tilted towards value hands, right? So if their range is tilted towards value hands and they're not going to bluff off enough, you in turn should be overfolding when they want to apply a lot of aggression because they're going to be weighted towards value, right? So if they're weighted towards value, top pair, top kickers, marginal, and top pair, no kickers, not marginal, right? So definitely be careful with that. And also these players usually don't defend their blinds enough. People who are too tight in general, people who play too few hands in general, usually do not defend their blinds quite enough. So look to steal their blinds, especially when you're in later position. And against players who play well, Figure out how they think about you if you possibly can. If they think you're tight, bluff a lot. If they think you're wild, play tightly. Now, if you are playing, let's say you go to your casino, you play 2-5, no limit. You sit down, there are three or four good players. And you know they're good, but they don't really know you. Or after an hour of playing, it's clear they're good and they're paying attention. If you just happen to have been tight for the, for the whole hour, this is a pretty good spot to loosen up a decent amount. Not a ton. Don't start raising the 7-2 offsuit or the jack-4 offsuit. But you should loosen up a little bit, right? If you've been very wild, either because you've just gotten good cards and they've seen you betting a lot, or maybe you've shown a few bluffs, you probably want to chill out a little bit. Don't be super nitty, but chill out a little bit in those scenarios. Look to apply aggression in intelligent spots, usually when you have the range or nut advantage. These are good, good, good spots to bluff a little bit more often um, whenever you know that you have more nuts and you know they lack nuts, right? We discussed this thoroughly in the advanced tournament course. When they want to put money in the pot, usually good to fold. And you generally want to avoid the better players and focus on the bad players. You got to realize you make money when your opponents make mistakes. If your opponents do not make mistakes, then, well, you're not going to make any money from them. We're out of time for today. Poker coaching students are going to be starting the study session with Louis Philippe very, very soon. As you see, there's a whole other page to this document. You can download this whole document for free, $0, at pokercoaching.com slash cash tips. Download it, print it out, look at it before you play. It's going to be very, very beneficial for you. Okay? 
I hope you all have a great holiday season. Am I going to be here next week? Let me see. I may not be here next week. I don't think I am. I'm going to an indoor water park with my family. So I will not be here next Monday. I don't know if I'm going to be here on the 2nd of January. I may, I may not. Ooh, it's a busy season. Poker Stars tournament's coming up in the Bahamas soon. I'll be going to the Bahamas. If anybody's in the Bahamas, make sure you say hi. Happy to meet up for drinks or coffee or whatever. It'll be a lot of fun. iPhone app, Android app is buggy. I know. Google is crushing me by not getting back to me and uh, helping me resolve it. It's been very, very frustrating. Are we having a New Year sale? Make sure you're on our email list. Probably. Probably. We have a New Year's challenge coming out. We're going to have something for you to do every day for a while to ensure that your poker skills increase. You got to realize when the New Year's coming around, it's a great time for people to get motivated to try to start doing new things or developing new strategies, but most people do not do it. But I'm going to do everything I can to make it easy for you if you opt in. If you opt into our New Year's challenge, I will send you an email every day of something to study, something to work hard on. And if after about a month of that, you do that consistently, you're going to develop habits around studying and you're going to want to do it. And you're if you study 20, 30, 40 minutes a day, every day, for a year, you're going to be pretty good at poker by the end of a year. And you're going to hopefully develop a habit that will stick with you, that will result in you continuing to thrive at poker and whatever else you want to start studying, which is very, very beneficial for you. On the preflop charts, if we are six-handed, can we just start in the low jack? Yes, that is correct. It's close enough. It's not exactly 100% perfect because whenever you're playing, let's say look at our tournament charts here. Let's say we're playing 40 big blinds deep. Um, what The way it works is when under the gun and under the gun plus one and under the gun plus two fold, actually under the gun and under the gun plus one, when these two seats fold, they're folding garbage, right? Which means it's more likely the players yet to act have better hands. But if you're six-handed, no one's folded anything yet, so it's less likely they have better hands, right? So you play slightly wider. Slight, slightly, 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 like 2% wider when they're less likely to have good hands. Anyway, as you see here, under the gun plus two is essentially the low jack. We have button, I'm sorry, big blind, small blind, button, cut off. This would be hijack. This would be low jack, right? When is the new challenge being launched? In the new year, not in the middle of the holiday season, Atlas. The beginning of the new year, it will be released. Um, so anyway, this would be the low jack raising range. It'll be perfectly fine if you do that. What do the cash game charts say? Do they say low jack? No, oh, they'd say low jack. We should probably fix that. That's a formatting error. So here, low jack would be under the gun six-handed. Simple as that. You'll be very, very close if you do that. That's going to be it for today. I hope you enjoyed today's show. Again, you can get the entire PDF with my cash game tips completely for free at pokercoaching.com slash cash tips. Call it a nice holiday gift for all of you. Enjoy it. Make the most of it. And I hope you have a great holiday season. I'll see you all when I see you. Good luck. Have fun. If you're a Poker Coaching member, get in these study sessions right now in the Poker Coaching Discord. Louis Philippe is going to be starting that very, very soon. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate all all of you, each and every one of you, I appreciate all of you. If you enjoyed the show, click like and subscribe. If you didn't, well, find someone else to enjoy your time with. I'll talk to all of you next time. Bye-bye.